But um, yeah, we'll just give it another minute or so before we uh, before we get started properly. Um, seeing as we're three or four minutes past the hour now, I guess we can we can get started. Um, so I'm assuming some hopefully some more people joining us in the next few minutes or so. Um, I can't see the Zoom chat here participants, so hopefully there's a few people uh, joining us remotely online as well. So uh, welcome to this session. So this is a just so you all know who you are. This is the Birds of a Feather session for the um, new prospective RDA working group. Uh, the short title is Verification of Genomic Tracks. Uh, long title, uh, Data-Driven Life Science, uh, data Life Science Through Granular Discovery of Biological Sequence Annotations Via Uniform Metadata. So this, this is one of the projects that is being, or one of the working groups that is being supported by the uh, RDA Tiger Project, which I'll explain that in a little bit. Um, for, so we'll just be... Um, just to introduce myself, my name is Ryan O'Connor. So I am working with RDA Europe um, and I'm the senior facilitator for the RDA Tiger project. So as I said, this is one of the work, new working groups that is being uh, supported by the project. So I'll just give a little a few minutes of a background on the RDA Tiger project and I'll hand over to my colleague, Svein Gunderson, who is uh, very much leading this initiative and he'll present on some of the background uh, that's led up to the the um, initiation of this working group and also where, where, where we're looking for the community to get involved. Um, so just some little bit of housekeeping first. Uh, welcome to everybody. Welcome to the people joining us here in Salzburg and also welcome to the uh, people who are joining us online. Um, so there is a collaborative notes document like there is for every uh, RDA session. Um, so there is a link on the um, on the screen. There's a bit.ly link. There's also a QR code. So that should hopefully take you to that notes document. Um, if you could, I'd, I'd like to ask you to just add your name um, uh, to that attendee list and your, your contact details as well. Um, and there'll be further opportunity to add your name to a um, to the kind of mailing list for the group or work so far so far if you want to get involved at that stage. Um, so yeah, if you're joining us remotely, the usual sort of rules apply. Hopefully we'll have a chance to um we'll be opening up for questions uh, a bit later on. But in the meantime, if you're joining us remotely, if you just keep your microphones on mute, that would be very much appreciated. Um, so just a quick run through on the agenda for the session today. So we'll just give a few minutes of uh, sort of welcome and introduction to everybody. Um, and I'll also be including just a very, very brief uh, menti poll in the next slide. So hopefully I've got my bearings. I'll be able to switch between PowerPoint and uh, Google browser um, in the next few minutes. But then um, hopefully that, that will go smoothly enough. Then I'll hand over to Svainong, who will give um, an introduction to the working group, specifically the kind of the background and the sort of main concepts behind it. Um, we also have two um, lightning talk, uh, lightning talks, uh, the pre-recorded uh, lightning talks. So I'll be playing those on the screen. Again, hopefully there'll be no technical glitches with that. Um, so two lightning talks, one from uh, Anna Bernasconi from the Politecnico di Milano, and the second from Peter Harrison, who's based Based in the UK at EBI Emble. Um, we'll then have a few minutes of a discussion uh, following those lightning talks um, led by Swainung. Uh, we'll be talking about possible links that people here in the room or people who've, who are joining us remotely will have with uh, other um, other RDA or the other RDA groups or other um, initiatives or um, projects that they're working on. And then we'll go a little bit more detail onto the 
uh, case the draft case statement. So as I said, this is a working group that's very much in its sort of initial stages, um, and we're in the process of putting together. Um, I say we very much fine on leading this initiative, um, putting together a case statement, and um, we're just going to give a few uh, minutes on that, highlight where we are with that, and where we're looking for community uh, input. And then towards the end, we'll just give a wrap up, very briefly wrap up uh, the session, and just kind of pointers on the next steps we'll be taking with the group. Um, so as I said, uh, as part of as way of introductions, um, we have a very very brief uh, mentee poll that we'd like people to, uh, to to contribute to. So there is in the collaborative notes, there's a link to the poll. So you, it'll, just if you scroll down the page on the second or third page, also if you can, you'll be able to scan the QR code on screen, that should take you to the mentee poll. Or if you just go to mentee.com and enter in five three five four one four five four. Um, and that will take you to the survey. I will just br very briefly switch to the PowerPoint, or sorry, from, from PowerPoint to the um, Microsoft, or to a Chrome browser. But uh, it, it, the the joining instructions for the Menti poll might go off screen for a second, but they'll be back on in a second. Um, and we'll be, you'll be able to join it. So if you haven't managed to connect to it so far. So one second, just bear with me. Um, Menti is still on screen, that's good. Um, and I will just play. Okay, so that is still on screen. Very good, I hope some of you have managed to connect to it. I see there's a couple of thumbs up, a few thumbs up in the corner, so hopefully that will uh, means you're connected to it. Um, so the first question for the mentee is very simple. Hopefully people will be able to answer it. It's just where are you joining us from today? So obviously where people are joining us from Salzburg, but where are you based? Where's home? Where's your home institution? Where you where do you where do you work? Also obviously people at home where um who are joining us um via, via Zoom, where are you logging on from today? Um whether this afternoon, this morning, wherever you are based in the world. So a few people from we have Edinburgh, my former home, um Europe, very vaguely. Uh, Germany, Vienna, uh, University of Oxford, US, so mainly Europe based so far, uh, France, um, Slovenia, uh, Colorado. So, yeah, as we'll be discussing a bit later, we're kind of looking to um, very much build the membership of this group. So, um, the more uh, diversity we can get in terms of uh, geographical spread is very much appreciated. But, um, yeah, it's good to see the people who have from a decent uh, spread, obviously Europe focus based, seeing as we are based in Salzburg today. But um, yeah, good to see some people from a bit further beyond uh, joining us. Um, next question then is just very, if you want a, a couple of words on other RDA groups that you're involved with, other groups you might be co-chairing, you might be, um, you might have contributed to some of their work, you might just be a very kind of passive member. Um, if you want to, um, this should be a free text box, you should be able to enter in a few uh, different um, uh, responses there. So if there are any other groups that you're involved in, they're not, not necessarily uh, linked to this uh, work uh, that this working group will be focused on, but any, any other groups you're looking to, that you're uh, involved in. So the professionalizing data stewardship, I think that's an interest group. I'm not sure if that's an interest group or a working group. Um, a few nuns. So it's good. Okay, that's good. Good in a way. I guess it's people who are, who are yeah, new to RDA, um, first RDA plenary. So yeah, that, Welcome to RDA, first of all, and, and hopefully this is a, a group that this will be one of the first groups you join. Um, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to kind of get you in on the ground floor of this group. Um, the active the active DMPs group, um, which is an interest group as far as I remember. I think they had a meeting this morning. Um, any other groups that people are involved in that want to spell out? Metadata interest group. We're trying to, again, we're trying to build, uh, as part of the session later, we'll be looking to, to discuss any uh, connections we can make with any other groups, um, either within RDA or uh, further afield. But yeah, it's good to see that some, there's some uh, good spread of people who are new to RDA, clearly, um, and some people who are more involved in uh, in uh, other groups. Final question, then, it's a very, very brief question. Just a very, uh, what is your level of interest in joining this working group? So as I said, some people are new to RDA, will be um, very much just here, because the session title might, might have appealed to them, might have just kind of wandered in, might be looking to find out what yeah, exactly some of the options here. We have plans to join the working group, considering um, looking to find out how the working group is relevant to this work. So they're obviously in the right place. Um, so seven responses for that. Um, good, I guess good in a way that we haven't any responses. So I'm not, I'm not likely to join the, to join the working group, which is uh, good at this stage. I don't know if, the, if we get the same responses at the end, uh, that would be 
That would be good. Um, but yeah, good to see the mainly people looking here uh, here to find out about the interest group, which is uh, obviously in the right place. Um, cool. So that is just a, the very brief uh, menti poll we wanted to put together for you um, to allow people to uh, kind of just get an, just for us to just get an idea of where you are with that uh, in terms of where, how you'd like to contribute to the group. Um, so I will go briefly back to my slides. Uh, P. Uh, and I will go back to um, slides and I think so we're on the menti poll. Yeah, so if if you are it's not sharing, is it? Um uh -huh. okay. I get some help. I think I thought I pressed the right button. Hey, okay. Oh, that's the one. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, thank you. So the um, yeah. So for people who are might be further interested in um in the working group, there's a a. a Survey that's been we've set up. Um, the Fair Tracks uh, project has set up. Um, so yeah, this uh, QR code will take you directly to it. Again, there is um, so a few more questions, a bit more detail about your interest in potentially joining the group and and your kind of background and how you might um, participate in this group. Um, yeah, the QR code on screen. Again, there's a link on screen as well. Um, but the, that link is also in the collaborative notes. So please feel free to to follow that. Um, so as I mentioned, this is this working group is one of the working groups that's been supported by the RDA Tiger project. Uh, so I'll just very briefly explain what the what the project is. Some of you might be aware, but most of you probably won't. Um, so this project is um, we set, started at the start of 2023, and essentially what we're trying to do is make it easier for RDA working groups to set up for them to perform their work uh, a little bit more efficiently, um, to take some of the sort of administrative and the practical burden from co-chairs um, and help them with the, in terms of setting up the group, um, going through the various steps they need to follow to become endorsed RDA groups um, and make sure that and to help them connect with the right people and make sure that the right people are connecting with them. Um, as I said, there is it's essentially what we're trying to do is lower the barrier to start working group activity. So co-chairs and other people who are more expertise uh, have more expertise on the topic of the working group can uh, focus more on that and produce some results and we, we can hopefully um, take some of the burden from them. Um, so this project is running to the end of 2025. We're currently working with uh, six pilot groups, um, of, of which uh, this ver verification of genomic annotations group is one. We're also working with um, four or five other groups now at the moment who have applied uh, to uh, an open call. This uh, open call is rolling for the, for the uh, as the year goes on. So we have four, um, four sort of closures for uh, deadlines uh, as the year goes on. Um, but yeah, if there's anybody who's any more questions about that, uh, please feel free to contact anyone or get in touch with anyone who is a, one of these tiger badge or tiger uh, lanyards. We're happy, hopefully happy to answer your, um, any questions you have. Um, very briefly, the, I, the what, essentially what we're doing is offering different services. So facilitation services, helping to work for the groups to uh, um, sort of uh, set up and, and perform more efficiently. Communication service to make sure that they're connecting with the right people, taking the burden away from them in that sense. Um, landscape and engagement, just making sure that the the uh, up, uh, kind of periodic updates so where the group is in the whatever landscape it is working in. And then output services towards the, obviously towards the end of the working group, um, helping with um, producing outputs and making sure that it's uh, accessible and digestible by people, people who need to, who people who need to uh, access it. Um, so yeah, as I said, um, please feel free to get in touch. We have a table downstairs, the RDA Europe table, um, and anyone who has one of these uh, lanyards, be, I'm sure they'll be happy to um, either direct you in the right direction or uh, answer any questions you have. So as I said, we have a few um, lightning talks coming up now. So I will just, uh, again, make a switch to uh, to my uh, browser. Um, and I'll just open. Okay, so the first one here on the screen. 
So I think my my is a no one. Oh, okay. Um, so just continue and then I'll let it doesn't come off from my Okay, great job. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, yeah so I'll just hand it over to, to Svein on here and introduce himself. Thank you. A bit of height difference. Hello, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining uh, and uh, taking the time to find a place that uh, wasn't easy for me either. <laughs> um, yeah, I, th I haven't checked, but I think perhaps I uh, might have won the competition over the longest session title. We'll see. Um, this one is a bit shorter, um, and we have actually changed the the name of the working group uh, since we submitted the, the application for for this session. So it's now called the verification of gen genome. Oh, genomic annotation is actually there's a misspelling there. Uh, working group. So um, I'll start by having presentation on the more of the background here, which is a project called the Fair Tracks. Um, and then uh, we will have this lightning talks, and then I'll see say a bit more about the current state of affairs and, and the case statement as it looks now. Um, so first of all, I need to talk about uh, the concept of genomic tracks. And if you are here the, uh, and have some background in biology, you might know this already, but many of you uh, probably do not have this background. So I'll say a few words about what, what is this. Um, so if you start at the sort of first image here, uh, this is a, the DNA, this is a chromosome. Um, and as you can see, there's sort of this unrolling of DNA into various structures, starting with the chromosome, and then it has something called histones, which are small, small, small circles there. And then in the end, end up with a very long line of, of DNA. Um, and this is the coordinate system that we are using here. Uh, this one single line of DNA, and you can sort of put the different chromosome after one another, and, and you end up with like one dimensional coordinate system. And everything that we are talking about here happens at that coordinate system. Um, of course, a different coordinate system for different people or different species, but, but the main concept stays the same. And then uh, there are these uh, track data sets in the middle. There's different variants of, of, of those. Could be a single, single position, something that's happening along the DNA somewhere with some interest, some functional uh, uh, elements or, or uh, experiment outputs that can be linked to some positions. Um, and, and there's also different kind of geometry that can happen there. So some cases, uh, events or, or, or this... this uh, Elements in a span along the regions. Sometimes it's just very positions or variant. For instance, some um, places where things change between people. That might be just one one single base pair in the genome. Um, and at the the, uh, the last picture here shows what's called the genome browser. That's a visualization software which was developed. Um, I think it was part of the Human Genome Project or, or very close to that, uh, the first genome browsers, um, because they saw that okay, you would need a way to visualize these data sets. So we can sort of have different data sets under each other and see what happens at this position um, comparing various data sets. Um, and it's important to stress here also that uh, you can use the same data for non-visual analysis. So um, when you say the name tracks to a biologist or a biophysician, they might typically just think about the, the visual part here, but the uh, statistical analysis and other types of, of, of analysis is equally important. Um, and the type of data that can be um, provided in this way is, is tons. I mean, there's lots of different experiments and different kind of uh, um, I'm not going to go into this because it might not make sense to, to many of you, but just lists all the variety. It might be variation, might be things happening in particular cell lines or cells in the body tissues, uh, different kind of binding of proteins or all kinds of functional information uh, provided in this way. Um, so what is special about genomic tracks as a data type? Um, 
one thing uh, which also makes me very interested in this is that these are um, data that is typically generated as the output of some sort of pipeline or a workflow uh, from raw data. So you have uh, typically, uh, in many cases, raw sequence files, and then you sort of extract the most important parts of that into this, this track data set. So, so basically, in many cases, these are summaries of the raw data. So you can uh, use these to um, more easily get an overview of what this data set is, is about. What's the more important elements here? Um, so that means that these two properties make track files very suited for data-driven discovery. Uh, not just from metadata perspective, but, but you can also extract uh, using for instance, AI methodology, uh, look at all of these track data sets and, and trying to find uh, relationships and so on without having to load the whole data set, which are much, much larger in, in size. And, and also you can then use it sort of the, to discover the data sets. Also, these are typically uh, stored in larger data sets with lots of uh, larger files, uh, sort of like a, a um, an abstract to to replication in sense the, the the essence of the data sets. There's been a plenty of large consortia that has have been producing uh, functional genomic data over the last twenty years. Here's a, a overview of some of them, and there's billions of of dollars or euros going into these kind of projects. Um, and the data that they have produced has been very, very useful for lots of different uh, research. Um, the main is, issue is that every single of these projects end up with the data portal or, or some of the position according to this particular data model. And, and uh, they are all sort of in, in, in compatible and the APIs are different and models are different. So, as a researcher, you would need to sort of go into everyone and figure out exactly how to get data from there and how to get data from there and so on. So this, there's an obvious need of integration of, of these kind of data sets. Uh, and th these are just the, the large ones. There's thousands of smaller projects producing data, uh, um, data, and many of those, as you probably can imagine, have, have also little metadata available. Yeah, so that, that's sort of the scope of what we're trying to, to uh, target. Um, and mainly in this, this Fairtrack project, which is a more uh, sort of finished uh, project in, in, the, in uh, the first round. So this is a bit just the history of what happened. So, so um, uh, I am a developer of a statistical analysis a software called Genomic Hypervisor um, back in from 2010, that was the publication of that. Um, and we had this framework and we wanted people to use it and we wanted people to import data into it. And then we tried different ways of, of getting data into that tool. Uh, first, we started creating our own collections of data. Then we started to create some data import tools, but everything was very ad hoc and, and didn't really scale. Uh, so that started this this project within the Elixir um, infrastructure, uh, an implementation study together with the, uh, so the I'm representing Elixir Norway and together with Elixir Spain and Emble EBI. Then we uh, started this in 2018, this project verification of genomic tracks at the time. Um, the recommendations was, was published a couple of years ago and uh, uh, it was selected as a recommended interbuilder resource, which is a, a, a sort of mark of, of a distinguished mark in, in the Elixir system. Um, yeah, and we have been since then, we, we have been thinking of how, how can we uh, scale up from, from that level and, and make this more global, get more players involved in this. And we also have done a bit of, of, of implementation on the side. Uh, so we happened into the RDA Fager uh, proposal, thanks to uh, Peter McCallum um, from Elixir. And now we have started to, to, to uh, raise interest and, and write up a case statement for this working group. 
the outcomes of the fair tracks project um was a set of recommendations which were published as i mentioned a couple years ago uh, looking into all the different uh, uh, fair principles how that they can be applied to uh, uh, this type of data um, and the, including also implementation. So, so we have implemented also a set of, of services. And um, we also sort of mapped out uh, a potential life cycle, how, how a, a, um, this verification process might look like. Uh, I'll not go into detail here, but, but the most important part is, is that the conceptually we're thinking this is a sort of secondary data life cycle. So you have the raw data deposited uh, with the raw metadata or the sort of uh, initial metadata at a very detailed level. And then we want to extract the most important parts of that into a minimal schema and have a more secondary cycle focusing on the, the track data or annotation data itself. We developed a metadata schema in the first tracks project uh, around five main object types. Um, and that schema is, is designed in a way that it re refers back to the original data sources using uh, uh, identifiers.org queries. Uh, the use, uh, we use ontology terms as much as possible. Uh, and uh, it is based on JSON schema validation. Then, as I mentioned, we have a set of services that we delivered as a proof of concept, uh, something for augmentation, which is sort of making data a bit more human readable. Then we have a validation service, we have a search service, and also as a, a client using the API of that search service, we have that implemented in, in Galaxy. Uh, so that is already there and can sort of jumpstart this, this uh, project here. Yeah, that was what I wanted to say about the Fairtrack project. These are people that has been have been involved, um, and different institutes and funding sources of, of that. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Well, then we have, as I mentioned, we have two uh, presentations now, uh, pre-recorded presentations, lightning talks, about five or ten minutes. I will uh, each. I will try and put those on now. In two seconds. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Okay. Okay. We're on the right screen, at least. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I also want to mention that uh, Anna Berlusconi, who's going to have, have the first Latin talk here, she was um, uh, she's did actually her PhD in a project which is very much like what I imagined. I didn't know about it until at the end of the Fairtrax project. Then I discovered that, okay, there's a group in, in Italy that's more or less than a huge infrastructure, a large project that looks very much what uh, I imagined. However, that's finished, and and there, uh, as far as I know, there will be no sort of further development of that. But uh, happy that we he, she will be joining this working group, and and we'll try to harness these two initiatives. So yeah. So I press play now. Hopefully, this works. Sounds. Yeah, no sound. Okay. Uh, do I put? Can I turn the sound on this machine? Do I press play now? Okay. Just rewind back a few seconds. And press play. No. Apologies. Sorry, everybody. Maybe. One second. Sound. Yep.
Hi everyone, um, I'm happy to be here uh, to describe our work called the Building and Integrative Repository for Genomic Data. This work uh, was part of the Data-Driven Genomic Computing ERC Advanced Grant that was run in uh, 2016 through 2021, led by Professor Stefano Ceri. The project uh, led to three main abstractions. First, the genomic data model, that is a model to describe genomic tracks into region data and metadata. The genomic, uh, genometric query language, that is the language to uh, express complex biological queries over the genomic tracks. And finally, the conceptual model, that uh, is a model to stand with semantics, the metadata describing the genomic tracks. Starting with the data model, we describe uh, data into regions that are made of a chromosome, star stop uh, coordinates, and positive or negative strand with their um, properties. A set of different regions are described by a unique uh, metadata file in the form of keys and values. A set of different samples, so pairs of region data and metadata, for a data set. Datasets can be processed all together, queried, querying uh, them uh, with the uh, geometric query language. Here we have an example. Suppose this is a, um, a genome browser view where we have one track for genes, three tracks of ChIP-seq peaks, and three tracks of DNA-seq mutations. Thank you. Uh, thanks to the query language, we can, for example, project genes into the related promoters. Then we can uh, um, cover only those uh, peaks uh, that are confirmed in at least two tracks. Here you see the cover to any. Then we have a join that allows to select only those promoters that are quite close, so uh, with an um, overlapping distance with peaks. And finally, we map uh, promoters into the uh, peaks and into the mutations. So we only select those promoters that um, are overlapping only at least with one mutation. The um, GDM samples, genometric data uh, model sample, is uh, also called item. Um, we realized that uh, the metadata into keys and values, this was a very poor representation, so we decided to give it more semantics. We represented it through this conceptual model that is centered on the item and then described by four different uh, directions. The biological view includes biological and technical replicates that belong to biosamples that are from tissues or cell lines and may be healthy or diseased, uh, assigned to a specific disease and may come from a donor with his or her characteristics. Um, the management view includes case studies connected to projects such as ENCODE, TCJ, or 1000 Genomes. Then we have the experiment type, that is uh, technological information regarding the assay, the feature observed, platform, and the target antibodies for epigenomics experiments. Finally, the extraction view, describing parameters used for internal selection and organization of items. Genomic conceptual model was used within, at the center of a big architecture for data integration. Metabase. It's called, um, starts from downloading from important genomic sources, transforming metadata into keys and values, cleaning them, removing redundant information, and then transforming this uh, semi-structured uh, key value format into a relational database format, where the database is designed based on the conceptual model that I described in the before slide. Then uh, a relevant number of attributes are also enriched, extended by linking them to well-known um, on, uh, ontologies. Uh, for this, we query the um, OLS system, ontology lookup system of MBI. And finally, we have a checker that is involved uh, with uh, uh, checking that uh, constraints are respected or not. Small focus on the downloader. 
we download at different points in time. So suppose that we look at uh, time zero and time one. At time one, we want to check which are the new items with respect to T0, which are the matching items. For these, we check that size, last update, and checksum are unchanged. Otherwise, we re-download the data and metadata files, and which are missing files, meaning that they have been deprecated at the source, so we also remove them from our archive. A focus on the mapper. The mapper is the, um, the, the module of our um, um, of our uh, architecture that is in charge of mapping information from keys and values to relational attributes and values. Here we have an example. The assembly and the file type, which have value GRCH38 and bad narrow peak, go into the item table. The item is connected to two replicates. So the two replicates are in turn connected to two bio samples that in turn belong to different donors, one 32 years old male and one four years old female here in this example. Another focus is on the richer. We start from basic information, such as here, the biosample comes from the MCF7 uh, breast cancer adenocarcinoma cell line. We connect it, it to synonyms and external references to ontologies. Here, for example, we have the experimental factor ontology or the disease ontology. We also connect it to three levels up and three levels down of hypernyms and hyponyms on the ontology. This is done through a semi-automatic uh, um, framework where we add a human in the loop, an expert curator that is in charge of checking that the automatic matches suggested uh, by our system for connecting our values to the uh, ontological terms are valid. Uh, as a result of this integration framework, we obtained the nine terabytes of data repository with more than 500,000 samples and 67 data sets. This is, in our opinion, the first solution that uh, joins together a broad range of heterogeneous data spanning from epigenomics to all data types of cancer genomics, including annotations. Uh, for now, we have in co roadmap epigenomics, CCGA, uh, genomic data commons, 1000 genome system, GenCon reference and also the GWAS catalog. Um, the repository is made searchable through the GeneSurf search interface, where we mapped uh, the uh, conceptual model into a checkboard and that is basically made of different uh, dropdowns, each for one attribute in the conceptual model, each containing all the possible values for that attribute. Using this checkboard, users are allowed to build complex queries where uh, conditions are in conjunction uh, across uh, different attributes are in disjunction across values within one single uh, dropdown. The results of the queries are obtained in the below table and we make searchable 2,500, um, I'm sorry, 200, um, 50,000 items, as you can see below. Just one focus on what we mean by semantic search. For example, suppose that a user is searching on chip seek data from the system source, then he may be interested in analyzing only brain-related tissue. Uh, we include only brain annotated the data if the original data search is selected. Suppose you want also synonyms, then we allow you to search also for for example, fetal brain annotated samples. If you choose expanded uh, option, then you will be included also hyponyms or parts of brain. As a bird eye view of our contribution, so we are helping by informatician, biologists, and geneticists to avoid querying many different interfaces and systems where um, different uh, consortia and data sources offer samples in very different formats. Uh, thanks to our integration um, framework, we 
uh, allow to search for um, uh, in a big um, repository from a unique GenoSurf interface uh, that queries our metadata repository that is also connected to the GMQL system. So all the information gathered from the repository can be then, all the tracks can be then processed using the geometric query language, as I showed in the first slide, also in the federated system. So now the bioinformatician, biologists, and geneticists only have a couple of points of entry to this environment. Thank you very much for your kind attention. I, I hope this was of interest for all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, virtual Anna. <laughs> uh, okay. So I will, unless it's fine, unless you have something to add to that or something to say about Peter's presentation, I'll move on to that. Um, yeah, I can, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, um, yeah, I can just mention that uh, Emboli BI has been uh, part of the Fairtrax project since the beginning. Um, it started together with uh, uh, Daniel Serbino, who was leading uh, the team that Peter Harris now is, is uh, taking over. So, so, um, but Peter Harris is then leader of the gene orientation team at EB and Bell EBI. Uh, they will help me to, yeah, I mean, he will say more about this uh, virtual Peter. Um, so, yeah. And just there was a comment in the uh, Zoom chat there. I'll provide links to the presentations. They will be included in the in the um, recordings, but I'll provide links to the presentations themselves and I'll get access to the uh, slides as well, include those in the, in the session notes, the collaborative notes. So I'll just open up Peter's presentation here. And uh, let's hope. Hi, I'm Peter Harrison. I'm the Genome Analysis Team Leader, European Bioinformatics Institute. Today I'm going to talk to you about two of our services, the Ensemble Genome Browser and the Track Hub Registry, and how this relates to the verification of genomic sequence annotations, particularly genomic tracks. So the European Bioinformatics Institute's mission is to help scientists realize the potential of big data in biology. We do this through the provision of huge amounts of freely available data and through our freely available services by performing our own cutting edge research and technology, and then also through a huge amount of advanced bioinformatics training of the year. So we're providing freely available services and our expertise to support data coordination, archiving, annotation, and the presentation of data at scale. One of the flagship services for the European Bioinformatics Institute is the Ensemble Genome Browser. This is a genomics platform for enabling and accelerating down, downstream science. So responsible for the reference human genome assembly, but also supports our own annotation that we do across the tree of life. This is aiding in the interpretation of gene annotation, of comparative genomics, variation, and regulatory data. We recognize both as an Elixir core data resource and a global core biodata resource. We're making uh, available and support key tools and data resources for researchers uh, to conduct their own research. We give everything that we do away for free as soon as it's complete and available. Um, but as well as performing our own um, standardized annotation and generation of gene trees and transcripts and protein structures and variation, we also present a huge array of community generated genomic tracks. We're really keen to continue to improve upon how these are standardized and reported and represented and both through our own genomics browser, but also globally. So a huge focus for us really is standardization across all of our different uh, reference uh, annotations for different species. So there's a huge challenge for us at the ensemble at the moment in dealing with scale. So we're traversing from, from several hundred to tens of thousands of different reference genomes, and this is driven largely by biodiversity data projects, such as the Earth Biogenome Project, primarily through projects like Darwin Tree of Life and European Reference Genome Analysis, where we're going from typically having uh, 200 reference annotations um, to tens to hundreds of thousands as we scale to annotate um, all of the eukaryotic life on Earth. And then also, in accompanying to the number of species, the size of these genomic data sets increasing is also the amount of associated variation and expression data people are submitting along with them. And then this also is increasing the standardization and, and fair description challenges around the, both the incoming data sets, but also around all the associated tracks that people are going to submit 
um, alongside each of these different species, uh, and also um, the provision of community reference genome annotations. So we're going to be dealing with uh, a huge number of different community tracks and different gene genome reference annotations. We want to be able to place in the context of our own standardized annotation for each of the species across the tree of life. This can be uh, really helped through the use of standardized identifiers and with file format developments. And really, we're, we're trying to play a key role in development and standardization of the GFF3 format as one of the future ability to be people to be able to submit decoupled annotations um, to public archives. And one of the ways in which we're trying to, to that we've been supporting uh, so far in, in the sort of standardization of, of genomic tracks for presentation in genomic browsers is through a service called the Track Hub Registry, which is really this collection of publicly accessible track hubs that have been submitted by the community. Its goal is really to allow um, the community to, to advertise the track hubs that they have to make it easier for researchers around the world to discover these and for ourselves um, in our genomics platform to be able to represent these uh, to the community so that people can find and display their own genomic data and the genomic data of consortiums that they're interested in alongside our standardized reference annotations. So this track hub registry already hosts over 8,000 different track hubs, allows users to register track hubs that they have, provides open access to these hubs via its user interface, it's its own trackhubregistry.org, but also allows you to search for these hubs from within the Ensemble platform and also from in other genomic browsers such as UCSC. So really what we're allowing people to do is to search these hubs through, through keywords, allowing additional filtering over things like species and assembly and hub and data type. But really we're relying on and really need better metadata. So this is where um, all of these efforts around the verification and standardization of genomic tracks are so important, and particularly in, in encouraging the community to provide and be able to provide better and standardized metadata around these hubs to make them more discoverable and more usable within genomics platforms. So we also provide detailed views of all of the tracks that are available. We're running health checks to make sure that the files and the, so the underlying uh, tracks are still available, um, providing all of the links to the data resources, and then um, providing a range of different links out to different genomic browsers so you can view each of these track hubs um, in uh, Ensemble, UCC, Vectorbase, and so on. But really, one of the key things for us is, is allowing us to then integrate all of these different tracks within our own ensemble uh, genomics platform, allow you to then attach, um, search for and attach these tracks to the standardized reference annotations that are presenting and view them on alongside each other and browse them in a genomic context. Um, so we have a, a submission process for you to register uh, new track hubs that you have to update and then, then remove them as required, um, both through the, the web interface, but also through REST APIs if you're registering a large number of different tracks. Um, we perform multiple checks during the submission process to try and ensure data integrity and integrity, but there's still a huge amount that could be done here as a with the community to try and improve the verification um, of the tracks that we're presenting. But really, also what we're really needing to do through um, different working groups, such as the one that's being proposed here with RD3 uh, Tiger, is to an ensemble and track a registry, really keen to improve their metadata descriptions around these tracks and really around how we can then make these more discoverable, both within our own platform, um, but also for, for different um, genomic impact platforms and downstream use. And one particular area of interest for, for Ensemble is the emergence of this decoupled annotation. So the people being able to submit GFF3 files um, for their own um, community-based annotations of all of the different reference uh, genomes that are becoming available through the biodiversity projects under the Earth Biogenome Project umbrella, and also in agriculture to really try and have an array of different uh, available community reference annotations that can be presented alongside our own standardized uh, ensemble annotation as well. So really with that, um, I'm sorry if I couldn't join you today at uh, the event, but if you have any questions about the Ensemble um, Genomics platform or about the Track Hub Registry, do feel free um, to email me at p2dbi.ac.uk. And I'd like to acknowledge the, the huge effort that goes into the um, generating the Ensemble uh, standardized annotations on our Ensemble Genomics platform and uh, our various funders for funding our um, research. Thank you.
Thank you, uh, virtual Peter. Um, okay, I'll just switch back to uh, the slides. I'll, that's why I don't take over. Um, there is one question in the chat, and I'll read that out in one moment. Um, I'll just switch back to the slides before I do that. Um, okay. Um, one moment. I'm on the right page here. Nope, I'll just switch ahead. Nope. And there we go. So that's the right page. Give me one sec. I'll just read out that question from on the chat out loud just so everyone in the room has a chance to listen. So, so yeah. Uh, yeah, so the the question in the Zoom chat is from uh, Paulette uh, Leiby, who has uh, said that um, there are two genome presented, uh, two genome browsers presented. Um, so asking why are there two um, and how are they distinguished? And Paula has, has said in the chat that um, she's not a biologist. So, it's fine. Yeah, right. So um, there is uh, there's a number of genome browsers in in many uh, different ways. Uh, first of all, it's different software, right? So so I think the the first genome browser was the UCSC one. That's uh, University of of uh, California Santa Cruz, um, and then Ensemble one came uh, soon. But then there's uh, there are other genome browsers being implemented in various con contexts and and uh, some in JavaScript, some in all kind of different. Program languages and so on. So, so that that is uh, one thing is the software, uh, and the other thing that discerns genome browser or let's say genome browser instances is the coordinate mm -hmm. system. So, so as I mentioned, uh, all of this data is then put into uh, referring to one reference DNA sequence, and that could be different. So, there are different versions of that, and there's different species and different genomes. And all of those need a particular instance of a genome browser being set up for that coordinate system. So, so in that way, it can be is, is, is really thousands of genome browsers instances. Um, any questions from audience? Sarah, no, or no further questions at the moment. Um, well, I have said, uh, yeah, thank. Okay, thanks. Yeah, she gets it. Um, yeah, if, if anyone else who's um in the room wants to ask a question at this point, please raise your hand. I'll hand over the microphone. Or if anyone else in the Zoom uh, has any questions, um, I don't see any questions in the chat or uh, in the room. So um, I think we'll move on to the discussion around the case statements. Well, over to you. Yeah. Um, so in the agenda, there was a point about registering interests. So we are skipping that in, in due to time, but we will, of course, have come back to that in the discussion after my presentation so that anyone who's interested or have some 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 other other uh, groups or other um, initiatives uh, that want to raise, raise their interest in, in this, then please do that afterwards. Okay, so... so uh, we have had a few kickoff meetings and uh, discussed this with a number of people, and there has been quite some interest. Uh, I'm glad to say that. Um, and we are now in the process of writing up this case statement for the new working group. Um, one of the uh, issues that we have had to tackle um, is the different ways of, of describing in this uh, type of data. Uh, there's a Scandinavian proverb called, uh, or saying that the dear child has many names. Um, and this has been very confusing when you're actually working in the field as I've been doing for a number of years, is that um, it seems like every new publication tries to invent their own uh, name for this type of data, especially for when you talk about non-genome browser and non-visual analysis. Um, yeah, so there are some of the uh, terms that's been, been used. Um, after some discussion, uh, the current suggestion is that we will call this genomic annotations. Um, in particular, because tracks, typically people think of just visual analysis for the word tracks, and we want to make sure that we also include uh, non-visual analysis. Uh, and then there is the concept of what's called the genome annotation, which is confusingly uh, almost the same word. Uh, and that is tracks in a more limited context. So, so that's when you are uh, putting together together a new uh, assembly or a new uh, that would be a new 
reference genome. Um, and then one of the initial things that you typically do is then to figure out, okay, where are the genes here and where are the other features of interest? So the initial exploration of, of a genome, and that is called genome annotation. Uh, uh, and this particular process, there's tools for that, and there's a particular file type called GFF, uh, which is focusing on this part. Uh, and then, then there's a lots of other different types of data, which are also then uh, genomic annotations, which are, which are not the genome annotations. So I'm, I'm sorry for the confusing <laughs> nomenclature. Um, we're trying to do the best we can with, with the terms. <laughs> um, So there seems to be three main use cases that has emerged from the discussions we've had a couple of last couple of months. Um, and I'll show go through them for you. And these are the ones that's that's now in, in the case statement. Uh, the first use case of this um, that we will focus on is the issue of collecting uh, data sets to build AI models. And then this is typically uh, biomedical data sets. Uh, due to the fact that most of the data is of biomedical nature um, and, and also the methodology development is, is in that context, but, but it can be also in, used in other contexts. Um, and, but, but, but this, this uh, sort of is, is the newest and, and the most cutting edge use of this, but, but you don't have to do data modeling AI, AI methodology to uh, make use of of the the solutions that we're creating in this use case, though, and and there's a number of analysis tools being developed over the years. And as you see here, this is a um, the genomic hypervisor was early early on here, but a number of these tools and many of these have had the same problem that they want people to get some data into the system so that they can uh, do their analysis, but but um, everyone has to try to figure out uh, their own way to do and do that. So all, all of these kind of tools would would be sort of evolved in this this use case, but with the AI methodology on, on, on the top here. Um, a bit a side note, but uh, it's a bit of interest. So, so it's interesting to me. So this is an old slide um, from the Genomic Hypervisor project, and we were thinking of use of this in uh, AI and other kinds of solutions for a very long time. And the way we thought of that uh, back in the days is to think of this whole uh, um, coordinate system, like, okay, you have this one dimensional genome, but then you can add a number of, of tracks, and then you have all the other metadata fields, so cell types and genomes and all of these these things. And this creates a huge hypercube of, of, of data that you can have different views into and so on. Uh, so uh, one month ago, I was in... <laughs> well, not go. I went to the uh, G848, which is a global alliance for global health um, plenary in, in, in San Francisco. And I uh, saw a slide on uh, using um, AI based on this kind of data. And had the slide more or less exactly the, the same here. Uh, and the, the uh, uh, so this was from from Anshul Kundaje and and the, the tools that he was developing is very impressive, and that just says something about the cutting edge of this and and the need for for data and usage of the data. Okay, so that's the first use case. Um, the second use case that he, we have uh, uh, looked into and have raised some interest for is. Uh, um, but I said the more limited aspect of genome annotation, meaning the the initial identification of genes and important uh, things in 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 uh, in new genomes, and there's a number of new genomes these days. So there's a biogenome uh, or biodiversity projects all all over the place, and uh, they are all sort of or perhaps not all, but very many many of them are collecting this umbrella called Earth Biogenome Project. And uh, in the end, it is planned to, to sequence uh, millions of genomes. And for each of those genomes, there will be this initial annotation. Um, yeah, I said some of this. Um, uh, typically, sometimes these are created from computational workflows. Sometimes they're manually created. Um, and 
there's a very new report from this summer from the Earth Biogenome Project stating some recommendations on the metadata that should be provided to these annotations, these initial uh, annotations. Um, and they also said that there is a great need for metadata standards for this. There is little um, infrastructure around the annotations themselves. So, so what we are aiming for here is to uh, work on establishing the genome annotations, I think in particular of these GFF files, as a fair object in itself, as, as, as something that you can have a net files that you can search for and that you can uh, uh, more easily integrate with. Um, today, it is often difficult for for uh, people to publish them at all in, in uh, existing Repositories. There's some work to improve that, uh, as, as as Peter Harrison is, was mentioned. Um, but but still, this is uh, in the infancy, and and we are aiming to sort of be a more of a uh, metadata laboratory, sort of for this, figuring out what kind of metadata could be usefully applied to this data set, and and what kind of infrastructure we can build around this. Um, yeah. So that's the second use case. And then the third use case is is a more an infrastructure one, and that is uh, enhancing the track hub infrastructure that Peter uh, introduced us to with more metadata. So metadata on the level of the files, no, uh, the existing metadata is mostly on on the collection level. Um, yeah, so that's the third use case. So how are we going to do this? Uh, and this is the current plan and and this is a set of recommendations uh with the implementations um to to create a, a setup that in most cases would would solve the the most important challenges here um the first as we mentioned several times is the metadata schema um we have the fairtrax schema and there's uh, several other schema uh, schemas also from the chico project and and the International Human Epigenomics Consortium is also involved here, um, and some others. So, so first we will try to harmonize the existing schemas. They're not that different, so so it shouldn't be that much work. Uh, and then we will expand on that with what's needed by the use cases. Um, and uh, we're not sort of aiming at uh, solving everything and having uh, fields for all thinkable metadata. These are fields for the most important things that the users would use for discovery and, and, and search and so on. And then we can link from that to the original method, which will be more full and more, more also more diverse. Um, yeah, so that would be the, the first recommendation. Uh, the second, and that's probably the most important part here, is, is the uh, metadata transformation flows or, or mappings. So we have all these different sources and we want to make them into one harmonized uh, collection. And how can one do that in a uh, maintainable way? So I'll say a bit more about that later. Um, the third one would be uh, once this data is, is harmonized, then you would we would have a way recommendations for storing them. And what we are aiming for is to, to recommend storage persistent storage of the metadata in harmonized form uh, in uh, public repositories like Zenodo, uh, where they can be live and harvested by anyone in the fully public uh, in its original uh, form. Uh, and then with PIDs, uh, so Zenodo does provide DOI, so that's a sort of simple way to provide that. One could also think about the ways to, to make more uh, um, file level and as far as that yeah I'll say more about that uh, uh, and then the last thing is a standardized API for search so the actual search services will not be part of the project because there are already several represented here but uh, uh, if <laughs> using different search services uh, they have different APIs then you're sort of back to scratch there we haven't really solved anything so we need to harmonize the APIs also and then we can have different search services and providing the same API. Okay, so say more about uh, two other recommendations, number two and number four. So two is about getting the data into proper shape. 
And uh, we have identified there is a series of general steps that you typically need to, to do. And, and the problem is how can we, uh, first of all, sort of generalize these different steps? Can, can we not have to <laughs> rebuild everything from scratch every time? Uh, how can you sort of scale up? So some of this, this I mean, even, even if it's metadata, then there are huge uh, collections of metadata that need to be parsed and, and harmonized. So, so there's a scaling issue here. Uh, and you want to sort of automate that when there's new data, you want to update that, or, or, or and also what happens when the, the metadata changes, uh, the source metadata, what about when the schema change? Because you want to, to evolve it, right? What about if the, the ontology changes, a new version of ontologies, or perhaps you will decide to switch the ontology to something else, and, and, and uh, different sort of mappings, they also would evolve. So, so, so there's a very much thought I need to go into the concept of maintaining a changing infrastructure. And I think this is the most important part that makes data stale after a while. And there's different initiatives, and uh, this is the most important part where I think they haven't scaled enough for, for, for change. So, so, so this is an important part of, of what we're trying to do here. Uh, we have a Python library or data flow framework building on um, industry-made infrastructure called Prefect um, that we aim, aim to use to, to uh, help solve this problem. Um, and then we'll um, make use of the experiences, uh, especially from these uh, GenoSurf and IHEC projects um, to try to build maintainable pipelines. And then about the PIDs, and uh, so that is uh, important this this uh, conference, I think. Um, yeah, so I mentioned that the DOIs are probably quite easily supported, so so that's the sort of low level, low hanging fruit. Um, there is a upcoming GH4H sc standard called sequence collections, and I could sort of talk about that for an hour, but I will not do that. But basically, this is a way to uniquely identify a reference genome, um, and this is a, a content derived identifier. So, so basically, uh, whoever generates the identifier, if they start from the same reference genome, they would end up with the same identifier. Um, so this is something that we plan to adopt to, to, to pinpoint exactly what are the coordinate system that the data set refers to. And also which genome browser instances are available that can show this. That's also a use case for that. Um, so one idea, and, and this might be out of scope, might be too difficult here, but, but at least something that I will personally would like to look into is can, can you do the same kind of content right identifiers for the actual genome annotations themselves? Can say that, okay, if you have uh, uh, this file, then you'll always end up with this identifier, um, even though it's represented a bit different ways. Uh, yeah. So words about collaborations and adoption. So, so this is very much a, uh, we're trying to solve a particular problem for the particular large, large infrastructure. I mean, there's large, lots of data sets here, but still it's, it's focused on, on genome annotation data sets. Uh, and we wanted to do the best we can with current knowledge and recommendations and standards. So we are very interested in uh, collaborating and adopting outputs from, from other places so that we don't have to invent everything here. Uh, so as, as much as possible, if, if there are existing solutions that we can sort of uh, adopt and easily make use of, uh, that will help uh, help build this, then we're very interested in that. So some, some of the uh, working groups or interest groups that uh, we have identified in RDA that might be relevant. There are some groups in the Global Alliance for Global Health um, that's very relevant, and there might be some others that we're not aware of. So please let us know if you know about something that's not well listed, if, if you can elaborate on the things that listed or know about something else, then we're very interested about that. Yeah, and the last, my last slide here is about building community. So uh, we want to 
get people involved uh, that have a passion for data integration involved in this um, so that this once the project the working group is finished that the community doesn't fall apart at this hopefully will be start of a, a larger community that can help maintain this uh, if not then it will sort of end up with a stale stale solution as several other initiatives so so this is a very very important part um we have some uh quite some some interest already um but there's plenty of people out there that could be uh, interested in contributing here so um yeah i think that was more or less what i had to say um I forgot an uh, acknowledgement page here, but I um, uh, want to acknowledge, of course, the Fairtrax project, uh, as I also already did, and the people who have contributed to case statement. They're listed in case statement document uh, now, and there's more people that haven't got around to put their name there yet. Um, I want to thank Peter McCallum for Alex Hirst for making us in contact with Arya Tiger. And uh, Jeff Christensen from the um, Australian BioCommons to that got me in in touch with with the relevant people in Australia. Yeah. So moving on to the discussion or comments or uh, questions part. Yeah, I guess I so. We, we don't have any. So yeah, I think we reached the end of the slide. Maybe there's one more slide for me, but then um, we can we can have a quick look at that towards the end. So, it, it, does anyone have any questions on anything? I know it's quite probably quite a lot of information from people. So I can't see any questions in the Zoom chat so far. Um, but there's any questions in the room? Yes, I see your question. So, um, for those people on Zoom, I'll just hand the the microphone over. Um, so to when I, when I hand the mic over, just introduce yourself so, so for the viewers at home. And uh, yeah. There you go. Yeah. So thanks very much, Spinning. Uh, Peter McCallum from Elixir. So, uh, so I have a question. You've talked about the the interest from the community, and th there were kind of two different directions in the examples that you gave. One is towards, I guess, sort of single cell and cancer and and that multi dimensional matrix on a single species, and one is is the cross species um, harmonization. Which of those two groups is is biggest, and 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 which one is kind of driving you in in this process? I I mean in in the context of the working group now, I'm of course I I don't know which are biggest in the global scale of things uh, that you probably know better than me. Um, I think they're quite even handed. Um, so I think there is there is uh, quite a bit of interest in the biodiversity uh, uh, aspect because uh, there's not so much work being done in this. Uh, so so we we seem to have found a, a area where where there is a need. Um, um, but there is uh, uh, also plenty of interest from from uh, more biomedical and, and and that field. So. It's a bit hard to say <laughs> right now. Um, there's interest for both. <laughs> but I, I perhaps slightly more from biodiversity if, if I would be for the current set of people. But I mean, it's not so many people that will tip the other way. So, <laughs> and and is there is, is there a strand working on the the mappings between the coordinate systems when you go? species to species is is that part of the definition yeah so there's not so much in i haven't talked to people who are interested in, in the downstream analysis of that and, and the comparative genomics which you're aiming at so so these are most people that are producing uh, uh genomes in biodiversity projects and they are seeing a lack of they don't know where to put the annotations or how to how to manage them in a good way, and and uh, there is a sort of lack of metadata there. And, and so, so that's most for, mostly from the producer side for now, uh, but there is obviously a downstream part there, also. Thank you. Are there any other questions from anyone in the room on anything to do with the focus of the work the working group or the Swingers presented so far on the case statement. Um, I'll just double check the uh, 
the Zoom room. Is there something in the chat? Ooh. I'll just double check what the question is. Uh, okay. Nothing in the chat so far. Um, so any any final takers for the anyone wants to pull up their hand? If, uh, another question. Perfect. Hi, Josh Young, Phoenix Bioinformatics. I'm curious if you've given any thought to uh, identifying different recommendations or standards kind of based on the level of investment or maturity in a community, right? Like I see value in um, making sure the ladder has as many rungs as possible and recognizing that say the biomedical community has a different level of resources and investment than <clears throat> biodiversity, but they would both benefit from having some practices or standards around integration. And so I guess I'm just, you know, I didn't hear that that point explicitly and I can see it almost being a maturity model, you know, not that one is more senior than the other, but that you can increase integration by having different, different levels just to identify and communicate uh, what, what practices and standards are used. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if I really understand. Uh, um, I mean, the maturity models is 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 uh, are thinking in co in context of the actual metadata that we're gathering here, or are it more about the way we are contacting communities and and then talking more about that, more or... the metadata, the like yeah. the level of um, there there may be lower levels of uh, compliance or standards that are being met and then higher levels but right. th they're they're both present right so that i can see a natural um outcome where more developed uh disciplines or more resource disciplines set a high standard the uh less uh less resourced disciplines can never meet right and so i think there's value in in having a ladder right having mm -hmm. here's here's a beginning level if you do anything do these three things if you if you can do more do these five mm -hmm. yeah and that yeah I know I understand what you're saying. Yeah, that's a very good idea. Um, it's definitely, uh, and as you mentioned, especially these these two use cases have a bit different level. I mean, I mean, they're uh, in some cases starting a bit from scratch uh, uh, in in the uh, biodiversity context here. Um, yeah, yeah, that makes much sense. So, so, so are you involved with uh, with uh, these models and how to sort of um, describe them and and uh, my organization is a data producer. Yeah, that is not my role. So it's it's something I think about. Mm. But yeah, no. no if if you know anything that uh, I think there are in in the Luxir context, there's several um, projects in that, and the EOSC also they have a maturity model concept. I'm not involved so much into those things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so Fabio Liberante from Elixir. Um, so more of, more of a comment, I guess, than, than a question. And um, back to the comparative genomics, you mentioned the hashes and, and for the sequence. And I think that's one of the challenges, right, of, of placement. So in that if you have a genome that's not assembled yet for these you know, species, we don't know something like that, I think is going to be crucial because then you can you can have annotations almost almost completely independent of location. Um, and that, that would probably help a lot for that sort of comparative and, and for novel genomes as well. So. I think that's definitely something to to look into in more detail. Yeah, no, um, I definitely agree. So I've I've been uh, part of this working group in GH4H, working on this for a couple of years, and uh, we're very close to uh, publishing the first. So the first draft is is published uh, like a month ago or something, and and uh, uh, we are going to to start the process very soon of uh, establishing this as as a standard. Um, <laughs> I can also mention just in passing that uh, so right now we're we're focusing on on the existing reference genomes, uh, but this is designed in a way, and we already thought about the way this can be expanded for pan genomes. 
so a particular set of of genomes that goes into pan genome, which is a more uh, uh, typically graph based uh, structure for visualizing. But basically, it's the data is just a set or a collection of sequence collections, collections of, of 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 genomes, basically. So we can just add a level of uh, of um, um, just another level, like the same on top of that, and then we can do the same for for pan genomes. So that's probably one of the things that we'll look into in in uh, version two or something. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Another question for you, Vladimir. Again, maybe just a last note. Uh, I don't know much about uh, about genomics, but I do about API harmonization and consolidization. And uh, if you start with uh, with the uh, open I open API specification and developing and versioning from uh, from the beginning, there there are a lot of tools like Swagger for documentation online, like. Uh, more and more developed collections that uh, practically in some way of test driven development uh, kind of drive and and version it and that is that is good so that, that there you will probably and in that maybe we can support if we find uh, if we find some time but one question is uh, uh, could it happen like it happened in our different use cases that uh, uh, if I understand well, uh, the APIs are going to be driven by ontology or by the expansion of the terminology and so on. Could it happen the other way around? That the needs of the that the needs of the uh, users who are performing the searches and who are using the APIs can actually drive the definition of some necessary metadata and uh, and uh, objects that you will need for uh, for uh, even for structuring and for indexing. This this happened quite a lot of times in uh, in uh, other applications we had that uh, we started with the ontology and then the APIs and the the needs for search have developed uh, quicker than the than the actual uh, than the actual uh, vocabularies or things. Yeah, um, I very much agree on your uh, your uh, uh, experience. <laughs> I mean, I have to have the same same uh, uh, sort of experience as a user because this the whole Fairfax project started. Uh, as a downstream user of the data and and uh, uh, what was provided on the, from the different consortia is uh, in many cases not what you would like to have been there as a user right uh, so this whole project is a bit bottom up in that way that we are trying to make this as usable as possible uh, but but then i mean we're not uh, necessarily perfect users so we're also interested in getting that kind of feedback from uh, other uses, and that's also a reason why. I mean, so uh, yeah, I didn't say much about that, but uh, I, we sort of try to think about different roles that you can have in this kind of community. And one of the roles is, is the end users, uh, and there it's very important that they're there, even even though uh, they sort of know nothing about what happens on on on, uh, on top. Then uh, having people that would like to use this uh, included in the work group is very uh, useful and so that because then you can drive the end results make sure that what we are producing is actually useful thanks everybody is there any other questions or comments from anyone in the room is there anything in the chat if on the zoom chat um nothing so far Okay, I think we're coming towards the end of the session. Um, so there is just one, I mean, I did mention at the start of the uh, session that with this one of the groups is being supported by the Tiger Project. Um, so yeah, so I, I know the last few minutes of every session is usually just to kind of wrap up. Okay, here's what we've done. Go on your, your break. But I'd just like to kind of reiterate, so we are, at the, this is one of the groups that is being supported by the Tiger Project. Um, so we are at the stage of, very much at the initial stage is the kickoff, um, putting together a case statement, um, which is linked in the in the collaborative notes. But what we, what is vital and what I can't really sort of uh, not, uh, em, well, I 
can't overemphasize at this stage is that we do need at this stage some community buy-in. So if there's people here who feel that this work is is some way relevant to their work, to their fields, to their um to their disciplines, um, we really do need people's buy-in at this stage. So uh, at, at, so far this um initiative has been completely driven by but by, by Swain Long, who's written well about 95 percent of the, the case statement so far, but by uh according to the, the various RDA, RDA criteria for different working for working group setups, we do need other people to contribute and to be able to, and one, just to meet the different the RDA criteria and two, obviously, to make it more applicable. We're, it's it's um, The idea is to make it sort of, uh, to focus on different use cases across different domains. So we do need buy-in for, for that. Um, what I'd like to ask people is to, to, to access the case statement, to please review it. Um, and there's a table at the bottom of that. Please add your name and contact details to that. Um, to be sort of included with at the group uh, in the group as it goes forward. And if you do feel that you might have um, a bit of an interest in taking a lead uh, or contributing to the how, the direction of this group, we are looking for actively looking for co-chairs of the group. Um, so finally, we'll be taking one of those positions, but we do need at least three. Um, I need to be kind of spread uh, ideal, well, uh, ideally across uh, across different geographies, but uh, um, across different disciplines as well, given the given the focus of the group. Um, so if you are interested, there's a link on the screen there to the uh, just a very, very brief declaration of interest form. If you are interested in becoming a, a co-chair, it's just a name, email, and just, and just a couple of sentences about why you might, might be interested. The link is on the screen there, but it's also in the, in the collaborative notes. Um, in the next few weeks, then we'll be looking to finalize the case statement, getting, gathering together different conversations we've had here today and the different, we've had a couple of uh, other kickoff meetings in the last few weeks. And um, we'll just be compiling those and putting that information and hopefully um, putting that into a, a, the final version of the case statement, submitting that to the, the RDA uh, Technical Advisory Board and also opening it up for community comment. Um, but yeah, at this stage, the more interest and the more uh, uh, more engagement we can get with people who are, whose work uh, this uh, working group touches on the, the better. Um, yeah, and we'll be doing more mundane things in the next couple of months, like like organizing different schedules for different online meetings. The usual sort of uh, um, working group um, approaches to, to, to these will be will be uh, will be set out in the next couple of months. Um, yeah, there is a, as I said, this group is being supported by Tiger, so. If you have been a co-chair of a different of a of a working group before, we will hopefully be in, in position to help you help take some of that administrative burden, some of that sort of organizational burden from you, and to hope hopefully make you allow you to focus a bit more uh, focus a bit more of your efforts on the actual content of the group itself. Uh, but yeah, just a take home message: please, if you're interested, please put your name in the case statement, put your name uh, um, on the uh, the at the very end of that case statement document and we'll we'll add you to the to our mailing list and then we'll hopefully get working on the case statement um in the next couple of weeks so uh, any final words to Svino to wrap up uh yeah so so um since i forgot to put the acknowledgement page there is one acknowledgement that i forgot to <laughs> uh, put there and that is for the aria tiger and and the work with ryan and and uh, the others from the group that's been really valuable and and uh, if you're interested in, in uh, applying for help from Maria Tiger from other working group or project or interest group um, then please do so because uh, I could not have done this alone even though I have written quite much of the text alone it's not a one one man job at all so thanks a lot There's any any other final questions or comments in the room? There's nothing in the chat. I guess we can end the session exactly on time, which is a, which is a problem. I hope that's a good sign. Um, yeah. <laughs> thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining us. And thanks, everybody who's joined us in the Zoom room. Well.